Welcome to the UMass Core Facilities Seminar Series. This is our last seminar in the fall semester. Today, we are hosting the UMass Scientific Glass Blowing Lab in the College of Natural Sciences with Director Sally Prouch. This facility provides high quality, affordable price, standard and non-standard items, glassware modifications, repairs and custom designs for instructional and research needs. I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. We hope that with these biweekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass Corp facilities offers to our campus community, the New England region and beyond. Next, just a few housekeeping items. The seminar is being recorded as you just heard. All replays of the seminar in this series can be found on our website. I will put a link in the chat. We will save the Q&A until the end of the presentation. During that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Next, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to the Director of our Core Facilities, Andrew Bernard. Andrew? Thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for, as Lisa mentioned, the uh, seventh and final seminar of the Fall 2021 series. Uh, today, we're, as again, Lisa mentioned, we're going to be discussing the UMass Glass Blowing Lab, one of the non-centralized resources here at UMass that add a whole lot of value to campus and beyond. While my primary responsibility is to advocate for the 30 centralized cores, I appreciate that there are a significant amount of resources throughout campus that the research community can take advantage of, and I hope to share more of them as we move along. If you know of any campus resources you think we could advertise or share uh, information on, please make sure to share the details with me. Uh, and since this is the last seminar of our semester, we're already starting planning for the spring. If you have any resources you'd like to see, technologies you want to learn more about, or science that benefited from having used the cores that you would like to share, please let us know. At least we'll be putting a survey link in the chat and we'll be reaching out widely soon. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the core facilities at UMass, please make sure to reach out to me or feel free to go directly to any of the core facility directors. We're here to help and, and make your research more productive. Before I turn it over to Sally, I'd like to take a moment to thank Lisa for uh, organizing and hosting this among many other seminars over the last three semesters uh, in, in the pandemic world. I'm grateful for her support and without them, we wouldn't have any of these. So thank you very much, Lisa. And of course, thank you to all the cores and invited speakers who have participated and made these seminars enjoyable for everybody uh, to participate in. Uh, so with that, I will happily turn over to Sally so we can learn more about the glass blowing shop. Go ahead, Sally. Okay, so um, I'm Sally Prosh and I'm um, here at the UMass Glass Blowing Lab right now. Um, I have um, two videos to show you and a PowerPoint to show you. Um, the first video I'm gonna show you is just a quick tour of the glass blowing shop. And then I have a PowerPoint with the history of scientific glass blowing. And then I have a, a video of a demo that I um, did for y'all. So I'm gonna start with a screen share. And am I doing this right? You'll have to bear with me just a little bit. Uh, that didn't seem to work. Okay. I, I don't seem to be able to do the screen share. We can see your screen, Sally. It, it, it was the whole, okay. the whole desktop. Okay. So you can still see it? It, it, it went away now. <laughs> oh, okay. So let me try that again. Sorry. Um, yep, we can see the desktop now. Okay. There we go. Hi, um, my name is Sally Cross, and I'm going to give you a little tour today of the UMass class. Just to let you know, we are located in room A19 of the low rise of the LGRC. When you come into the lab, we try to welcome everybody from all different countries. We have a lot of people using this lab, and so I try to write welcome to everyone. So this is the glass blowing lab. Um, what we're here for is um, to fabricate parts and to repair and make parts for anybody that wants on the five college campuses. Um, when people come in, they fill out a work order form that you can see here, and um, then we make whatever they want. We have a couple examples here of things that people want. This is a, we call it a reactor top, 
that they broke. And so I'm gonna um, replace one of those um, pieces on top there. Um, so what we start with are, are parts that are manufactured. Um, I'm just gonna pull out a part here. Um, this is a little valve that's manufactured and it's a number two. So that means there's a two millimeter hole going through there. Um, and these are manufactured and they're standardized worldwide. So if somebody in China um, breaks their glass apparatus um, that was made here, they could go to the scientific glass blower there and have the same components um, put on. And you can see there's a lot of drawers here and all these drawers are filled with different things. And I just opened up a couple of them here. Um, that was a, a glass valve. We also have Teflon valves, just in case you don't want to use any grease um, that would contaminate um, the material you're working with. So all these are, are um, got parts in them for people to use. Um, over here on this side, we have what we call joints. Um, they're also um, vacuum type seals um, once you put grease with them. Um, and then over here, these are, uh, I don't make you dizzy, um, working areas. There's a small lathe there and a medium lathe and a larger lathe. What these lathes do, if you think of um, a machine lathe or a wood lathe, um, it does the same thing. It rotates the glass quite a bit slower for us. And we heat the glass um, while it's rotating and we blow into it or we shape it with graphite tools versus a chisel, we use a graphite tool. Behind the lathes, we have cabinets full of glass. We try to um, keep some things in stock for people. Um, so we have two millimeter um, up to 200 millimeter um, glass tubing for people. Let me show you the smaller ones, um, both in borosilicate and quartz glass, fused quartz. Um, so a lot of times people want different types of glass and we try to accommodate for that. Um, we also have some annealing ovens um, whenever you work glass, you put strain into the glass. And so what we do is we take it up to a certain temperature to relieve the strain. And you can see inside this oven here, we just put the glass apparatus in there and anneal it. So we have the smaller oven and we also have a larger oven available for us. We have a vacuum pump. Um, here we pump down things and seal them off if people have on um, certain compounds that they want sealed off into an ampule, um, we could do that for them. And just like a wood shop, we have a belt sander, um, but we have to use water with this belt sander. So it can get a little messy sometimes. Um, same with the cutoff saw, um, we use water there also. And we also have a drill press um, that we use water with. And you can see the drill bit is a little bit different than a wood drill bit in that it has a hole that goes all the way through. I don't know if I can show that very, oh, there we go. Um, and water goes through there as we cut the glass. The reason why we wanna use water is we don't wanna heat the glass up while we're cutting it. Um, so those are the things, some of the tools that we have available for us to use in the glass shop. Just gonna walk over here real quick. We also have a student area for um, people, students to learn a little bit about glass. We are having a class this semester. Um, they're learning different things, different ways of, of making glass. Um, right now they're working on condensers. So you can see here is a start to a condenser um, and they'll be finishing that up next week. So we have um, a 10 bench student area. So we can take up to 10 students at a time. Uh, I wanna show you a little cabinet of things that have been done here in the past. Um, we have a big kind of coil 
And this coil just kind of shows how flexible glass can be. Um, we have some kind of really nice condensers here, um, tubes within tubes, um, some, some different things that I keep around. Like um, I've made these quite a few times before. I keep a couple around as samples so that I can re, um, remake those. Um, so we have some items in here that have been made previously. All right. Um, okay, so that's the first video I want to share with you. Um, so let's see, I have um, another um, PowerPoint I'd like to share. Pull it up. Can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so um, glass has been very important um, throughout history in the scientific world. And so I'm just very quickly gonna go through some things um, to show that how glass has been used. And if you think about it, you know, what, where would we be without glass? How much um, do you use glass every day? Um, so here, this is 14th century, we have hourglasses um, being made and all of a sudden time is um, of the essence. <laughs> um, crown glass windows. Um, some of you may have heard that um, glass is a liquid and some of the windows are thicker at the bottom because they are slowly melting. Well, that's a really cool myth, but it is a myth. Um, the reason why it's thicker at the bottom is because when they spun out these big, they called them rondelles, they would cut the glass and use the thick side down when they put it into the window. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit more later if you want. Um, the telescope using glass, ground glass to magnify things, 1608. Um, I really love this picture. This is um, some people in the town square playing with mercury. Um, so 1644, you have these glass apparatuses with um, mercury showing pressure. Um, Newton using a glass prism to find um, the, the light spectrum. And um, this is kind of curious because he did this during the pandemic. And so he was kind of quarantined into his apartment. And so he played with glass and found the spectrum there. We don't know the exact date for the microscope, but um, it's been very important and they continue to make better and better microscopes by using um, better and better glass, ground glass. Um, thermometers, this thermometer is just so beautiful. I love the shape of it. But 1670, people are starting to um, take temperatures with glass thermometers. The Leiden jar, sometimes we use glass so that we can see what's going on in the inside. So here um, with the Leiden jar, you can see the electric charges going on on the inside. Um, the bell jar, very important um, to learn about photosynthesis and um, Boyle's law. So 1662, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, the Geisler tubes, thousands of these were made and they thought at the time that they had kind of healing properties. Um, they had an electrical charge going from one electrode to the ele other electrode. So they would evacuate this tube and fill it full of different gases and get, <coughs> excuse me, different lights um, happening. So that predated the light bulb. So you have to think, well, who really invented the light bulb? Um, but Edison brought the light bulb to manufacturing capabilities and used filaments. So 1879, lots of glass blowers were making lots of light bulbs at that time. They were all handmade at that time. Some of you may have gone to the Harvard glass flowers at the Peabody Museum. Um, these were made by two generations of people um, making glass flowers, exact replicas of those flowers and leaves um, so people could study them 
at Harvard. Um, the Dewar, 1842. Um, so this is, oh, 1892, sorry. Um, so, you know, I remember being young and having a thermos bottle, um, a tube within a tube so that you could keep things cold or hot. Cathode ray tube, electronic tube. So we're starting to get into X-ray tubes, all different types of tubes to learn more about things. The diffusion pump um, to speed things up, you know, taking taking out vacuum pressure. Um, so this is a very old style diffusion pump. We have new um, styles now. The NMR, um, probably a lot of you. Um, you know, take your samples to the NMR to see what's going on in there. All those samples are held in glass, small glass tubes. And the semiconductor chip is all made with silica. Um, here you see on the right-hand side, a silica wafer that is being put into a furnace tube. Um, those wafers are being held in place with quartz, we call them boats. And then that's a wafer finished on the other side that's um, going to be cut up into little chips. Fiber optics has really changed the world. Instead of using copper, we're now using fiber optics to transport information. Um, big, big thing. Th these are made out of fused quartz, different layers of fused quartz that are pulled down into thin um, rods. And I'm not sure about this. I'm sorry, I have to apologize for this slide. I'm not sure about this slide. Somebody else put it into this PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but one thing that I helped with was the gravitational wave. Um, they wanted to hang these big, beautiful pieces of pure quartz somehow. And we hung them with fiber optic material. So that's what I was um, helping with. And um, you know, I, when I first started working with the people um, on this, I was like, oh, I don't know about this gravitational wave. I don't know if it's really real because they've been looking for it for 150 years. And it just took, you know, the right technology to find it. And glass was helpful in that. And we keep continuing to look at new things. Um, here's some cells um, made with um, a different type of glass to look into dark matter in space. So let's see, uh oh, now I have to exit out of here, uh, sorry. And I um, have one more video of me demoing something. Are you ready for that? Um, I have to pull it up for you first. Hello, oh, do you um, so we'll see how this, let me, let me, uh, okay, do you, can y'all see that? So, yep. so I just want to show you some of the work orders that come in. Some of them are, are quite simple, like please repair this. Um, and I'm just going to be putting that on the end there. That's pretty easy. But then we have some more complicated things. Um, sometimes we make manifolds like this and sometimes repair manifolds. This is a repair job where they actually gave me the parts. Um, they, they had a piece like this that was right here that broke off. And so I'll be making that, that area for them. Those things um, take me a little bit um, and they wanted to see something would, from start to finish. So I thought I'd do something just a little quicker. Um, so that you can see how glass melts. Um, so I'm just setting up the camera here for you. I'm putting on a didinium lens so that you'll be able to see into the plane a little bit easier. Um, so what I'm gonna make for you um, is a bubbler. It's something that's often used um, by people on the vacuum lines. So I've already made some of the parts here. I put a bubble there and I put a little ring in it and I constricted this area right here. I'm gonna cut that now um, with a tungsten carbide blade. Um, glass is very strong. It's rated for a 10,000 PSI when it first comes out of the oven. 
but then if we get a flaw in it, it becomes very weak. So here I'm actually going to put a flaw into it by scoring it. Sorry, I didn't get it. Breaking it apart, and you can see how easily that broke. So there I have the end of the bubbler. Sometimes people want a really small constricted end, so I made that constricted. The flame that I'm using here is a gas oxygen flame. The gas that I'm using is propane, but we can use um, different types of gases. I'm just going to turn that down. But there we go. Different types of gases for different glasses. Um, for something that I'm working today, or a silicate, I'm going to be using just this gas oxygen flame. But if I was using quartz glass, I might use a hydrogen oxygen flame. That's a little hotter. So I'm going to set that down. We're going to make another part that that will go into. The torch I'm using is a, a Carlisle CC bench burner. It's um, kind of a standard in the scientific glass blowing industry. Um, right now, I'm just going to close off the end of this tube, and that's usually what we start with. They're just tubes and rods, and then we make our forms with it. Um, I'm going to close off that end and round it off just by heating that up. And I'll blow into this end to make it round. Have kind of a test tube kind of looking thing. And sometimes, yes, I do make test tubes for people if they want a special size. But most of your test tubes are made by machine. So I'll be changing the flame um, depending on how much glass I want to heat up. So right now I'm just heating up a small, small area so I can have a small flame. We're going to blow this out to make a hole. I'm going to take my time to blow it out so that I don't blow it too big. I want the little ring that I made on the other piece to fit inside. And you can see we can blow the glass fairly thin, and it's it's so thin that I can just break it. It's kind of like cellophane, and I'll break that off into the trash can. And I have an open end. We'll fire polish that. We'll close this end off. Hopefully, this will fit inside of there. All right. We're going to even shrink this flame down a little bit smaller, and I'm going to keep this together. Um, we have many different types of seals that we do in scientific glass blowing. This one is called a ring seal, and I do teach it in the class that um, we have here. So hopefully by the end of class, the students will be able to make their own bubbler and their own condenser and their own small manifold. So there, I'm heating the glass and letting it shrink down and seal around that area. I'm going to turn and blow just to expand the glass a little bit. And we'll do that a few times so that it blends together well. And if any of you have done ceramics, it's very similar to ceramics. You want those connections to be very strong and sturdy. So I'm not caring about that centerpiece quite yet, but at some point you'll want to center that up. So now I'm just going to let gravity bring that centerpiece in line. There we go. And then I'm going to put a side seal, what we call a side seal, right here and then here. So to do that, I'm going to do a very similar thing. I'm going to heat an area, blow it out. Great. 
paste that on. And I'm also going to seal this side right here with a cork so that I can blow into here. Um, I don't need a lot of air when I blow because I'm getting the glass so hot. I'll get all those edges cut, seal this together, expand it so that we have now that's going all the way through. I want to work this out so that it has a nice smooth connection. Nothing will get caught in there. It will be very strong. Um, that's one thing that we always have to be concerned about is a lot of people are pulling vacuum on these things. They get thrown around. A lot of times I go in labs, all the glassware is in the sink. You know, you want it to be fairly strong so that it can withstand all those, those things. I'm just working that out. Now I may want to bend that up. So I'm going to increase my plane just a little bit. And we'll keep either side of it. It's not perfect, but we'll, we're going to go with it. Since we got all. So you see, see the glass is getting soft. I can bend it up, give it a little air, blow it out. I will also bend it the other way so that they can attach a, a vacuum line to it. So really you can make anything out of glass. Just have to know how to heat it and to shape it. Okay, before I bend this other side over, I'm going to uh, round this off down here because it's it's a little too long. We'll just take off this end. So I increase my plane because I'm working with a larger size two. And I'll we'll take off the bottom. Got to plug up the other side. Sorry, I got a little bit of excess glass on the bottom, so I'm going to take that off with a solid glass rod. That's a little better, and then we'll blow that around. Uh, again, we want to keep things fairly thick so that they can withstand being dropped, maybe, or um, maybe a vacuum problem. You don't want to blow anybody up. Now I'll come back here and I'll bend this to the other side. Change my plane, but we'll just go with it. And we have a, a cute little vacuum bubbler that people can use. They can maybe put some oil in here or, um, you know, see if their nitrogen is bubbling through their double manifold. Um, so anyway, that was something really quick that, um, that I could show you. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, so those were my little videos for you. And I'd like to open it up for some questions about the glass blowing lab, if anybody's got any.
So you can unmute yourself. Sally, how does the training work for students? Like how many sessions do you need to have before you can actually make something that's safe to use in the lab? Well, that yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, mm, you know, the semester um, that they're doing this, I don't think they would use anything that they make, but they're getting the idea of how to make those things. Um, they make, you know, they'll make a little manifold, um, but it's gonna be pretty funky looking um, and maybe not safe in their, in their lab. And they do realize that. Um, to get to be a proficient scientific glass floor, I think takes years of working to, you know, hard. Um, yeah, that's a, and it also depends on the person too. Sometimes I have people that pick things up right away. Sometimes people, you know, just have a really hard time with it. Um, do they come in just to do, like to learn how to do the repairs themselves? I guess I'm curious, like if it takes years to learn how to do this, then like, what are you gonna learn in like a couple hour sessions? Well, um, the class that we have is um, a semester long. And so they come in and they, um, you know, we, we do a little teaching, an hour of teaching at once a week, and then they get an hour of practice time. Um, so they, they do work quite a bit. Um, you know, I think some of the students, you know, I've had, they're, they're coming from another country where they know they're not gonna have a scientific glass blower there. And to do small repairs, like fire polish the edge of a beaker, or, you know, put something together very simply, is a big thing and it will keep your research going. Um, it also helps people understand, you know, what they need for their research, um, what types of glass they need, what type of apparatus they're looking for. So we talk about, you know, if you're working above 700 Celsius, what type of glass you, you should choose for your experiment? Um, what kind of, you know, different fittings do you want for your experiment and why? Um, so that's good for them also. I do have a couple of art students this semester too. They're getting their MFAs. And so that's very interesting. They're taking scientific glass and making it artistic. So um, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's very cool, thanks. And I think, Patty, are you on now? No, she's not. Um, we, we are, um, oh yeah, Patty, do you want to talk about maybe future classes? Sure, sorry, I think I interrupted you before. I was trying to sneak in and have another conversation going at the same time, but we do, we have a couple of classes going right. next semester that are um, grad classes. And after that, we're gonna go to UWW. So we'll be kind of looking for what people think they need and maybe adapting to that. Yeah, so that, that will be fun. I also would like to um, try to bring in more community things also. Um, yeah, so. That's exciting, thank you. Yeah, any other questions? So we put up your website there and, and, and uh, first of all, thank you. That was, that was great and, and fun and uh, impressive to see how easily you can manipulate glass without it breaking. That's really impressive. Um, but with your website, I assume that's how folks can find you. Is anybody on campus is, is able to come work with you? Um, yes, anybody on the five colleges can come. Um, we actually have some outside clients that I've made things for also. Um, we have a couple of um, professors that come in and I work with them, um, but mostly graduate students um, in the research departments um, come in. Excellent. So, yeah. That's great. Did you want to talk about your artwork for just one minute? Because I'm very excited about that. <laughs> yes, um, besides doing this, I have a studio at home. It's not quite this big, um, but I also do artwork and I do teach all over the world, um, just, the, just the artistic side of glass blowing. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I take these techniques that I've learned in, scientific, in the scientific world and apply them to my artwork all the time. Um, and it, it's, it's just a lot of fun. Um, so you might wanna try taking a class in Glass Point somewhere. So I'll be teaching um, at Sailing P Community College this next summer, Pittsburgh Glass Center and Penland School of Crafts. 
Um, and recently I just did a, um, a demo for the uh, Biennale, a glass Biennale in Turkey. Um, and that's where I made a, a little teapot for them for a demo. Um, so, you know, you could do a lot of fun things. Um, and I, you know, I make this look easy, but it's been over 50 years that I've been doing this. So um, it takes a little bit to get it flowing that well. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, do we have any more questions? I guess I'm the most curious one today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, ha I'll have to say, I, I think I chose a really good, um, you know, job to have. Um, it has taken me all around the world. I've gone to Japan four times, you know, Ireland, uh, Italy, Sweden, all of those places. I mean, Turkey, the, their, their governments or their people have, you know, paid me to come over and teach them glass blowing. Um, so I, I find it very exciting. It is definitely very exciting. Thank you so much. Thank well, you for having me. If there's no other questions, then I guess I'm going to close out the seminar. So thank you so much, Sally. That was just so such great information. And thank you everyone for attending today's seminar. This was our last seminar for the fall semester. Just a reminder that all replays of this seminar and the previous seminars can be found on our website. I just want to take a minute to say that Andrew and I just wanted to let you know that your feedback on this seminar series is very important to us. Our goal is to make these events informational and interactive. If there are cores or specific technologies you would like for us to feature in future seminars, whether they are part of the centralized cores or not, please let us know by filling out the form that I put in the chat. This form will also be available on our seminar webpage. Stay healthy and safe, and we see you all in January. Thank you. Thank you.